Okay, so for those of you who read the program a few days ago, you're expecting Bruna Brands. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here today, so I've stepped in to present some work that she's been doing with the team at CAMH looking at the effects of cannabis on driving. The focus today will be on the use of therapeutic cannabis and how that affects driving, but I'll also talk a little bit about some data from a study on the recreational use of cannabis and how that affects driving and compare the two. So at this stage in the game, we don't, I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare, but I will say that the study on the recreational cannabis users, uh, or the recreational use of cannabis was funded by CIHR, and the study on the uh, therapeutic use of cannabis was funded by uh, Ministry of Transportation of Ontario. So what do we know about the use of therapeutic cannabis? So the Canadian Cannabis Survey, which is a really great online tool uh, to help us understand whatever pretty much we'd like to know about the use of cannabis in Canada. Uh, according to the Canadian Cannabis Survey, back in November, October of 2018, about 13% of respondents have used cannabis for therapeutic reasons. Uh, those, those who have used cannabis, about 13% have used it for therapeutic reasons. What's um, maybe um, concerning is that about 66% of those don't have a medical document from a healthcare professional to use cannabis uh, medically or therapeutically. Uh, as one thing we've learned from this, I think from this meeting, is that there's a lot of potential for cannabis, CBD, THC, to be used um, medically, therapeutically. People may start self-medicating. There could be, we could, we could see an increase in driving under the influence of cannabis as a result of uh, these pushes and also of increased uh, legalization. Uh, we'll know a bit more in a few years uh, exactly how that ha uh, legalization has affected uh, the use of cannabis while driving. So what do we know about cannabis and driving? So the early literature on cannabis and driving is a little bit um, inconsistent. Uh, going back before the year 2000, people used a lot of subjective measures of driving. So they would have someone drive an actual car on a street and, and, a, and a, an instructor would watch them and rate their driving. So it was quite subjective. Um, the simulators didn't come into use till a bit later, so we had subjective ratings and also very low doses of cannabis. We know the doses of recreational cannabis have been increasing over the past, you know, decades. Um, now we, the average we heard yesterday, the average recreational dose is 17 percent. Um, a lot of the early studies used sort of two, three percent uh, THC cannabis. So. The studies before sort of 2000 were inconsistent. Some found impairments in driving, some found no changes in driving after cannabis. When we look at more uh, recent studies using simulators and more objective measures of uh, driving and also higher doses, so 8% THC and above, we see consistent, more, more consistent effects. Not all studies are the same, but we have sort of con uh, convergence of evidence that uh, cannabis increases weaving, what we call lateral control in this study. So the amount of movement within your lane goes up after you're smoking cannabis, as does uh, speed goes down. So I'll, I'll show you some qualitative data on what a decrease in speed could mean. Uh, the evidence seems to suggest speed decreases as a compensation for um, inability to maintain lane control and other impairments in driving. So. People always say, oh, you're a better driver if you drive slow, but the evidence seems to suggest that it's actually a comp compensation. What's surprising is there were no studies that we know of that are published on the effects of their therapeutic cannabis use on driving, simulated driving or otherwise. Uh, we can approximate uh, the her therapeutic use of cannabis by looking at frequent or chronic use of cannabis, because therapeutic users typically use every day. Uh, and the two or three papers that have been published on chronic frequent users, when they compare them to recreational use of cannabis, uh, they are inconsistent. Some find no change, no difference from recreational use, some find um, that they're worse. Uh, so there was kind of a gap in the knowledge in terms of what therapeutic cannabis does uh, to driving. So what did we hope to learn uh, from our study? Um, so how does therapeutic cannabis affect driving on a simulator, for one? Uh, and also, how does it affect levels of, how are levels of THC in the blood? Uh, how do they change uh, during therapeutic use of cannabis? And are there sort of, before they smoke, because these people use uh, cannabis every day, before they smoke, do we see residual levels of THC in the blood? Are there residual le uh, impairments in driving uh, before they smoke that day? Um, and how does this compare to the recreational, to recreational use of cannabis? 
So we hypothesize people often think if they're using cannabis therapeutically that they tolerate and they would be good drivers or okay drivers that they're fine. Um, and uh, but we and, and there's preclinical evidence that there's tolerance, but in humans. Uh, it's a bit muddy, a bit more muddy, so we actually hypothesize that we would still see a change in driving after therapeutic use of cannabis, specifically that we'd see changes in weaving in the lanes and also a decrease in uh, speed in simulated driving. So at CAMH, we, use, um, we study driving with the use of a simulator, and it provides nice objective measures of driving. We can give people recreational drugs, alcohol, cannabis, or combine the two even, and it's safe, and we can program various different types of scenarios into the simulator. We can do rural scenarios, urban. We can uh, introduce stop signs and see how fast they, they break. We can uh, really, whatever you can imagine, can be eventually programmed into a, a simulator. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's, we have two of these. They're the, both the same model. One is very new and another one is a bit older. Uh, they have a 180 degree view uh, of the scene that we've programmed into the simulator. It has a real steering wheel, a real seat, a real console, so it feels like you're in a car. It has a rear view, uh, the blind spot displays. The seat, the steering wheel, everything moves, so it feels like you're, you're driving. Uh, some people don't like this sen sensation. They don't, they don't tolerate it well, but luckily most people do. Um, so it's, it, it's a very real feeling of being in a in a car. Uh, so our endpoints in our study, so there's two studies that I'll show you. We had pretty much very similar designs, similar endpoints. The primary endpoints were mean speed uh, and lateral control or weaving, and we did, measured them both uh, when they were just driving and also while distracted. So uh, the distraction task we had them do was to count back in threes. So we gave them a number, start counting back in threes from 867, and they had to count back in threes. And you'd be surprised how difficult this is to do when you're actually trying to drive a car. Um, it, I listened to a few participants do this, and their counting was, was not in threes. It was in fives and tens and ones, whatever. It was very difficult for them to do this. So it's sort of a measure of distraction, so, sort of the way you look at texting or any other forms of distracted driving. We also looked at reaction time, so how we measured that was the time we had a rural scenario and stop signs would appear once in a while, and reaction time was the time it took to remove the foot from the accelerator and to, to press the brake pedal, so that was their reaction time measure. And we also had secondary measurements. We looked at subjective drug effects. Um, how much do you like the drug? How does, much does it feel like cannabis? Visual analog scale type measures, as well as the addiction research center inventory and the profile of mood states. And we also looked at THC and their metabolites in blood. So that's a mis um, I put oral fluid, but it's actually, we just, I'm just presenting the blood data today. So the first study, looking at the use of cannabis and recreational users and how that affects driving. So this was a younger population. They were aged 19 to 25. They used cannabis about one to four times a week. And we, ha we asked them to come in for, it was a between groups design. About 30 people in the end got a placebo and about 60 ended up getting the 12.5% uh, THC cannabis cigarettes. So we gave them a 750 milligram cigarette. It was an ad libitum smoking procedure. We told them to smoke as much as they wanted to get high. And then we weighed the cigarette before and after to estimate how much they got. And we used 12.5 THC uh, cigarette for the active condition, which is roughly a recreational dose of what's out there on the streets. So <clears throat> the visit uh, for the st two studies, um, this, the recreational uh, cannabis study, um, we, is actually a much more complicated design. I'm only presenting uh, d driving and THC uh, for, because of the time. We also looked at cognitive measures, subjective measures, um, and we also measured driving and, uh, so not driving, but blood and subjective measures throughout sort of an eight hour session. But I'm only presenting the baseline at, before they smoked cannabis and then 30 minutes after they smoked cannabis for THC and metabolites as well as driving. And then we looked at the residual effects. So are there effects uh, on driving 24 hours? And we also looked 48 hours after driving, but the two weren't different. So I'll just present the 24 hour data. What we found uh, for the driving data, we didn't see any effects um, contrary to hypothesis on lateral control. So their weaving seemed um, intact, well, it's, um, which is different from previous, a lot of, a lot of other pre uh, published findings. And reaction time also didn't seem to be uh, changed. 
the overall mean speed and mean speed being distracted were decreased after smoking the recreational dose of cannabis. So again, I don't have a pointer. So in the left hand panel, that's the overall mean speed and the right hand panel, that's when they're distracted. The purple bars are the recreational, the active group, and the blue bars are the placebo. The first set of bars are baseline, so before they smoke. The middle set of bars are 30 minutes after they've smoked. And then the third set of bars are the residual. So we see 30 minutes after they smoke that the mean speed decreases both when distracted and when not distracted. But 24 hours and 48 hours later, uh, they had returned uh, to baseline. Uh, so in THC metabolites, so the left-hand panel shows THC, the middle panel shows the carboxy metabolite, which of course is the inactive metabolite, and then the uh, far right panel shows the hydroxy metabolite, which is the active metabolite. So again, I'm, I'm only showing baseline 30 minutes post-smoking and residual. So at baseline in these recreational users, we see THC levels are below detection limits. So the roadside detection is two to five nanograms per mil. So we're not seeing any residual levels in these people. But of course, smoking the cigarette increases THC to uh, a mean in this panel here of 10 nanograms, but it went higher um, in subsequent data points and then came back to baseline within three or four hours. And not, not surprisingly, the two metabolites also increased. We see uh, levels at baseline of the carboxy, probably because these people are regular users, and carboxy metabolite has a long half-life, so we would detect it uh, for a number of days in the blood and urine. So the therapeutic cannabis, so I'm going to show you the same data points from this study and compare them to the recreational just to show you how the two uh, compare. So these were therapeutic cannabis users who had a medical authorization. They used every day. Some of them used up to five or six times a day, but they had to be daily users of therapeutic cannabis who were otherwise healthy. Um, and then we asked them to come in, um, and we asked them not to smoke the day of the driving session, and then they were able to go into a special dedicated smoking room and they would smoke their usual dose of cannabis. So that would be their first dose of the day was to smoke that, uh, their usual dose of cannabis in our laboratory. And it's the same, I'm showing you the same sort of design. So at roughly one hour before smoking, uh, we took blood, we did the subjective measures, visual analog scale, the palms, the R key, and they drove. We also gave them a self-report questionnaire. We had lots of questions about strain that they were using. Um, how often do they drive after using cannabis? I won't show you all data, just a little bit of qualitative data on how risky they thought it was to drive after cannabis and their propensity to drive after using cannabis. Uh, and then at 30 minutes after they smoked, we all again took blood um, driving and did the subjective effects. And again, they were asked not to smoke their usual uh, dose uh, that day. So they were presumably, um, look, we're looking at presumably they were in withdrawal or residual effects when they were coming in. So we had 19 people complete the study. Uh, 14 of them made it through to the driving uh, trials. Of the 19 people, 12 reported using cannabis within one hour of driving within the past year, which is, I think that's a lot. Uh, by comparison to alcohol, none had two or more drinks of alcohol before driving. So it's an interesting comparison. People seem to have different attitudes towards alcohol and cannabis. There's much more awareness of the effects of alcohol on driving than there is uh, cannabis on driving. And then about half of the participants reported there was only a slight risk of driving after using cannabis. So it was a five-point scale. Slight risk was the lowest risk level. Uh, for driving. So about half of them believe that there was really no risk in driving after using cannabis. These are people who use cannabis every day, at least, at least once a day, up to five, six times a day. Uh, for some qualitative questions, when asked to describe their driving after using cannabis, they reported being more cautious and drove slower. One person said, I may have been slower, but also way more paranoid and cautious because of it, and as a result, more focused perhaps. So we're seeing here this evidence, maybe they're compensating, uh, their decrease in speed is compensating for this paranoia and being cautious, knowing that they're not driving well. But by comparison to alcohol, with alcohol and cannabis, I drive worse than just cannabis. I don't like it, I refuse to do it, and limit my booze because, because um, uh, there was grammatical error. They find uh, a rider just stay home, they, they don't. They refuse to drive after alcohol, but they will after cannabis. 
Um, the subjective effects of so people often say, oh, I use cannabis therapeutically, I don't get high. This is not what we found. Uh, in our visual analog scale, they all showed increases in ratings of I feel this effect, I feel this high, I feel the good effects, I like cannabis, this feels like cannabis, and I feel the rush. None of them reported an increase in the negative effects of cannabis. Um, and in the RK, we saw that they reported some drug-like effects as well. So we're seeing increases in subjective effects as well. And in the time course, uh, in the recreational cannabis users, it actually lasts longer than the, the PK curve, just as an interesting side note. But uh, just that, yeah, we do see this increase in subjective effects in the therapeutic cannabis users. Um, looking at THC and metabolites in blood, so this is the recreational cannabis users compared to the therapeutic cannabis users. In the top panel, that's THC. The bottom left is the carboxy metabolite, and the bottom right is the hydroxy metabolite. At baseline, we see in green, uh, THC levels are three or four nanogram per mil, which, as we know, is a above the detection limit, uh, above the legal limit for driving. Even though they hadn't smoked that day, we're still picking up THC in the blood uh, above legal limits. Um, and 30 minutes post-smoking, we see an increase in THC in the therapeutic users, not surprisingly, because they've smoked. Um, but we also see it's greater in the therapeutic users as opposed to the recreational users. We don't know what str exactly how much THC was in their cigarettes. Um, they reported using a variety of different strains. Some of them used high THC, some of them used equal levels of THC, CBD. Very few, only one I think we used a high CBD strain. Most of them were using higher THC strains. And in the carboxy metabolite, again, we see increases after smoking. And in the green, we see the therapeutic users have high levels at baseline, not surprisingly, because it has a long half-life and they're using every day. And similar with the hydroxy metabolite, we see an increase after smoking and also uh, residual levels um, in the blood before they smoke. So driving data, so this is again the therapeutic uh, use compared to the recreational use. Again, same, same layout, as, layout as before. The overall driving mean speed is on the left and the distracted data is on the right. I don't have any asterisks on this one, but you see um, in purple and green, the two cannabis conditions, uh, we see decreases in speed relative to their baseline. Uh, the placebo doesn't show a change in, um, in speed after smoking the placebo cigarette. So what we're seeing here is therapeutic cannabis users are showing potentially the same change in driving as, as we see after smoking recreational use doses of cannabis, which goes contrary to what they're thinking they're doing when they're driving. Uh, so we do see that there's potential here for impairment in driving after therapeutic use. Uh, I'm looking at correlations after smoking. So we weighed the cigarette before and after they smoked their cigarette to estimate, get a sense of how much they were smoking, even though we didn't know exactly the dose of cannabis they were using because it was their own cigarette. It gave us an idea as to how much they were smoking. Um, and the speed, as you can see, goes down. Uh, the y-axis is mean speed, and then the x-axis is the change in weight. So the bigger the change in weight, the bigger, the, the more the change in speed that we see. So speed decreases as a function of how much they've smoked, uh, which isn't necessarily too surprising. And then the next panel is what we looked at. What happens, is there any change in their driving before they've smoked? So they haven't smoked the usual uh, dose that day, other residual effects. We didn't see overall changes in lateral control or weaving, but when we correlated weaving with their past cannabis use history, we did see an effect. So on the y-axis, we see um, uh, lateral control, so the, as it goes up, as the number gets bigger, that's more weaving in the lane. And then on the bottom y-axis, we have amount in purple, amounts smoked per occasion um, in their daily lives. And then in the blue squares, we have grams per day. So we see those, those who used more sort of on a daily basis seem to have uh, more uh, weaving at baseline before they smoke the cigarette. So what we have seen from this is therapeutic cannabis can affect driving, despite what people might think. Uh, we see a decrease in speed after smoking, and we also see positive relationship between weaving and amount smoked on a daily basis, which suggests there could be residual effects. We also see THC levels in the blood uh, above detection limits uh, before they've even smoked uh, that day. 
So the driving lab, so I mentioned Bruner Brands, which should have been here today, but she couldn't. Uh, she was the PI on one, one of the studies, and then Bob Mann and Bernard Fall were the PIs on the recreational study. Co-investigators, and of course, the many students who were involved in these studies over the years. Thank you. Any questions?